So we are so pleased to be sitting down with Anthony Horowitz, an author, screenwriter, and producer who is honestly so prolific that if we sat here and went through everything that he wrote and every award he's ever received, I think we would just have to close out this Zoom right afterward because it would probably take well over an hour. Uh, so we're just going to skip right over his 13 novel Alex Ryder Teen Spy series. We're going to skip over his two James Bond novels, which were approved by the Ian Fleming estate. We're even going to skip over, as much as this pains me, his two Sherlock Holmes novels, which were also approved by the Arthur Conan Doyle estate, um, and move right on over into uh, a little bit of his film and television work. Right, because if we went into that at depth, we'd also have to deal with all of Midsummer Murders and Coyle's War. And, you know, we will be talking, obviously, about the, I think, 11 uh, Poirot episodes that you wrote. So, uh, you know, we're very excited to uh, hit all of that. But I think that, um, you know, the reason that we're here right now is because it's not out yet in the U.S., but we're awaiting the release of Moonflower Murders, which is the sequel to, of course, Magpie Murders, which Kemper and I personally uh, love enough that we devoted uh, one of our Patreon episodes just to discussing it. Yes, we absolutely did. New to hear. Thank you both so much. Yes. So um, thank you so much for, for speaking with us, Tony. And we should also mention just up top, because the other, um, the other project which you're working on, which I think a lot of our, our listeners are probably aware of, is um, another mystery series uh, featuring the police detective Daniel Hawthorne and yourself. Uh, and there are two books currently in that series, The Word is Murder and uh, The Sentence is Death. Ooh, this, is is a, this, so is a, this is the third book which I was writing just before we began this talk. Um, I'm actually a chapter and a half away from the end. I've just got to do the reveal of who the killer is and the epilogue and the book is done. It's a really sort of critical moment to stop. As delighted as I am to talk, <laughs> I'm very glad because you know what, I, you may know this, one of my great fears in life is that I'll actually die before I finish a book. This is the moment where I have a massive heart attack and nobody ever finds out who the killer was in my new book. Normally, I actually leave letters behind in my office on the shelf behind me with directions to my wife and to my assistant. The killer was this person. This is how it was done. These are the clues. Please pass this on to someone who can finish the book. But instead, I'm talking to you. So uh, I just have to survive this interview and finish the book. And, and that will be the third Hawthorne. I mean, we will try to avoid any jump scares, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's like an acute case of uh, drudophobia, Edwin drudophobia, I suppose, or something. There should be, there should be some sort of like literary term for that. That's, that's fantastic. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, so that, that's great. By the way, is the, is the title of that going to be the paragraph is blank? Do you have a title yet for it? I do have a title. I can't tell it to you yet for the simple reason I haven't told my publisher. And my publisher <laughs> is, um, very likely to throw it out. Um, but she often does this to me. She takes title, my titles and says, no, I don't like it, it's not gonna sell. Um, and that gives me a block. So I have a, a, a habit now of never telling of a title until the book is finished. Um, but I might just email it to you the moment I hear I, if it gets a, a tick or a green light. I love the title and it's actually related to a, 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 a murder mystery writer whom I like very much. I wonder if you know his name, a guy called John Franklin Bardin. No, I don't. Actually. No, I'm getting, I'm getting silence here. He is, for me, one of the greatest murder mystery writers ever, an American. Um, he died some time ago, years and years ago now, and uh, only wrote really four books. But one of them has a title very similar to the title I have in my mind, and it's almost a, a, a nod to him, because he, like um, so many other writers that I admire, really was a, a master. Wonderful. Very intriguing. Now we're going to have to like investigate this a little bit. Just add it to our uh, reading pile. <laughs> if you can find a copy. I think they're, they're hard to get hold of now. Gotcha. Well, you know, the internet, the internet is magical in, uh, <laughs> in that way. That is true. Um, you know, I guess just to start, um, I think it's obvious why there's a sequel to Magpie Murders. It is set up so that there could be one, but um, I guess, tell us a little bit about how it was to return to Susan and to Atticus Pond and that world um, after sort of the success of Nightmare. Well, certainly, um, certainly, Catherine. Um, 
actually, I've already talked a little bit about the inspiration for Magpie Murders, because this fear of mine that I was talking about, the fear of dying before I finish a book, actually is the story of Magpie Murders, which is the story of a writer called Alan Conway, who writes Golden Age detective fiction, and who dies, uh, and the last chapter of his latest book goes missing, and Susan Ryland, uh, who is his editor, has to try and find the missing chapter, and in doing so, she discovers two things. First of all, Everybody in his latest book existed in his real life and is based on real characters. And secondly, one of them killed him. And when I wrote that book, which was, I think, probably my most successful murder mystery book to date, um, it was always going to be a standalone. It was going to be a one-off. I never actually intended to do a sequel. And the reason for Moonflower Murders was twofold. The first was, was that my publishers were very happy and loved that character of Susan in particular. Because she isn't a detective, she's an editor. And that's quite different. It makes sense. And also the fact that she is a woman. I don't often write uh, for main female characters. So I, they liked that too. And they really wanted her back. At the same time, we have a TV version of Magpie Murders coming out next year. And the producers of that show, the first question they asked was, look, where's the sequel? We need to know that we can do more than one season. So that concentrated my mind on revisiting Susan, who by that time had retired to Crete, and coming up with a second murder mystery that plays the same trick as the first one, that is Magpie Murders, but in a completely different way. I don't like repeating myself. So what you have here, I don't know how much of the story you want me to tell, but effectively it is the same thing. It is not one book, it is two books. A book by Alan Conway, uh, which is a golden age detective story, very much in the style of Agatha Christie or, or, or Dorothy L. Sayers or any of the greats of that period, which sort of 20s and 30s I'm talking about. And that is contained inside a modern mystery. So you have a modern detective story about somebody who is killed in Britain now, and the clue to who killed that person is contained inside a book written by Alan Conway and starring Atticus Punt. I hope that is clear to your listeners. That it's is always more difficult to explain than it is actually to read. I spend most of my life trying to make sure that these books are very easy to read and very enjoyable. But then when I come to describe them, I find myself getting completely tangled in knots. So believe me, it's, it's a, my analogy is always that it's a little bit like a watch. That, you know, a, a, a watch is full of complicated machinery, springs and dials and cogs and wheels and things. But telling the time is very, very easy. That's what my books uh, try to be. I like that. I, I, I like that analogy. Um, no, we we found that too because, as we mentioned, we had discussed magpie murders in a whole episode, and we, as we do, you know, you have to give a bit of plot summary to then have an intelligent conversation about what is happening in the book. And it is there is a lot going on uh, yeah. in in those books. I personally was flabbergasted that you were able to create a sequel that did do the same thing because it it magpie murders to me did feel like a standalone. Like, okay, he can't, he, he can't do this again. He can't figure out how to do it again. So the fact that you did is, you know, the fact that the book even existed, I was, all, my appetite was already uh, whetted from that. And, uh, and you, you did indeed pull it off again, which is. You've, you've, of course, you've read, you've read Moonflower Murders. You've had an advanced copy. We right. were given an advanced copy for this. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think that I, I'm the sort of writer who won't write a book unless I am fairly confident I can do it. I mean, you mentioned earlier Sherlock Holmes was a book that I was commissioned to write by Doyle, by the Doyle estate, his, his ancestors. Uh, no, I don't mean his ancestors, I mean his, uh, his modern family anyway. And um, um, I remember being very, very nervous about taking that on. And I wrote two chapters before I even signed the contract just to be sure I could do it. And in a way, it was the same with Moonflower. The hardest thing about Moonflower was that you have a, you have a setup where you have this time a, a complete book. It's not missing a chapter. You have a complete murder mystery, which is the book in the book, a golden age murder mystery, which has a beginning, a middle and an end, and the killer is revealed. And somewhere in that book is a clue to a modern mystery. But the modern mystery has to be completely different. Mm -hmm. You can't write the same mystery twice. So I had this idea that Alan Conway visits a hotel. He meets the people there. He learns about a murder that has taken place, a very violent murder. And then he writes this peculiar book, which has, seems to have no connection with it at all. And Susan Ryland has to somehow knit it all together and work out who is who and what is what. And how is Alan Conway telling us who the killer is? And why doesn't he just go to the police and say who it is? What is it that makes him decide to do this bizarre thing? So, so it took me probably a year to find the confidence to actually write Moonflower Murders and to realize, actually, you know, I can do it. That's well, I mean, I don't, I, 
it's so frustrating in this because we're obviously talking in advance of the book because I'd like to have a very spoiler heavy conversation, but we can't do that. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I think that the the twist that you found of why this book is incorporated um, is very hard to see coming. So, you know, when it's actually revealed, it's a, uh, it's, it's really clever. Well, the other thing is, of course, is that people who've read Magpie Murders know what to look for. They know right. that I use anagrams and acronyms and wordplay and all sorts of other devices that most murder mystery writers don't use. I mean, that's just my idea, that you can actually twist language itself to turn it into clues that, that point to the killer. So everybody is looking out for the big surprise in the last chapter. And I should say that surprise is there, but I'm happy to say the book came out in the United Kingdom about two months ago and it's done well. And I'm looking on Twitter for people to, to, to tell me, oh, we guessed it. So far, no one seems to have. No, it's, yeah. I know, well, I'm, I'm notorious. Um, it either drives, it drives Kemper insane, it drives, drives one of our listeners insane, it drives every member of my immediate family insane. But I'm like a notorious guesser. Like, I go into <laughs> a novel and... I immediately am like, okay, who, who done it? And I have to say, I'm almost always right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it really annoys other people. Um, but I didn't, I, this was not something that you're totally able to do. I mean, other than perhaps an Occam's razor <laughs> thing going on here, but. <laughs> But the joy of the murder mystery genre is actually that it's a win-win situation. Because as far as I'm concerned, if so, I mean, some people have guessed part of it. Because after all, you've got two murder mysteries, you've got quite a few murders and, and more than two murderers, actually, throughout the book. Right. So there is a chance you might guess part of it. But, to, but, you know, as a creator of the book, that's fine, too. Because, you know, when I read a murder mystery story, if I do guess the ending, I feel pretty pleased with myself. And I feel I've outsmarted the, re the writer. And although, as a writer, I might get a little bit, oh, really? I'm still happy, because my job is, after all, to entertain people in whichever way. As, you know, to me, the only important thing in a murder mystery book is that you should not feel cheated. That when you get to the final page and everything has been explained and revealed, all the clues should be there in plain sight. You should have all the information that you, like the detective, should be able to have solved the crime. And for me, actually, the real pleasure of a murder mystery is always being less clever than the detective, which I, which I am. And in the Hawthorne books, in which I actually appear as a character myself with the detective, you know, I'm a complete idiot. And he's a, he's a clever guy. And, uh, and I just follow three steps behind. You're the, you're the Hastings. <laughs> so, yeah, sort of. I'm both, well, actually, I'm both, I'm both, Hastings and Christie. I mean, that's what's interesting is I'm both I'm both the author and the and the sidekick. I'm Doyle and I'm and I'm Watson. And and it's an interesting, you know, the, that was an exercise. Now I don't know if we're going to talk about this in the time we have together, but I'm very, very interested in the who done it, the murder mystery as a genre and as a structure, as an art form, if you like, and trying to subvert it, trying to do things that haven't been done before. And given how many people there are out there writing murder mystery now, and how many there have been over the last hundred years, you know, ever since Agatha really sort of got the ball rolling with her, with her genius, you know, it is very, very difficult to come up with fresh ideas. And that's what I'm always trying to uh, search for in all my books, which is why in the Hawthorne novels, I came upon this idea, but the only thing I could do to subvert it and make you look at the whodunit in a different way, was to step off the mountain, which is where the writer is, with a view of the entire landscape and all the characters in it, and put myself into the valley where I am literally in the shadow of Hawthorne and, and therefore in the dark. Well, what's interesting about what you do, and I only just thought of it as you were speaking, but you know, we have often struggled with the fact that in the Sherlock Holmes books, for example, Watson is very um, clearly writing those, those stories, right? He is, you know, he, he is actually recording what happened. So he is technically the writer. You know, we all know that obviously Arthur Conan Doyle is the real writer of, of those stories. And in Christie, there's a lot of fuzziness, in, especially in the early novels, as to whether or not Hastings is actually literally writing the stories or just a narrator. And she honestly goes a little in, in either direction, depending on which novel it is. There's somewhere he is very clearly writing um, such as ABC Murders, he's actually writing, he's writing third person narration and there's a little foreword where he says that that's what he's doing. And then in others, he's clearly just a first person narrator as any first person narrator. And it's kind of what you're doing is taking it a step, a crucial step further where it's sort of like, you are, you're the sidekick, 
but you're the writer. I mean, you are, you are the creator, you're the Agatha Christie, the Arthur Conan Doyle. So it's, it's making that, you know, taking that to the next step and kind of, you know, making that your own. And then what can you do with the genre as a result of that? Um, so it feels like a progression in a way from, from that format. Well, it is an interesting observation you're making, Temple. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the mysterious affair at the Styles. I think the first word in that book is I, and it's Hastings talking about how he gets to meet uh, Poirot after he gets involved in a murder, you know, down in Torquay or wherever. Um, and um, I think it's interesting that Agatha Christie did have difficulties with that construct, because after a few books, she got, gets rid of Hastings, sends him to a ranch in Argentina, and doesn't bring him back until quite a long time later, because I, find, I think she did find it quite difficult. And I often, when I'm writing the Hawthorne novels, get a little bit irritated by the fact that I cannot take the view of what everybody is doing, because it's something incidentally that Agatha Christie does extremely well, that when everybody is getting onto the Orient Express or onto the ship that's gonna go down the Nile or whatever, you, all, you can see see them in their own worlds before you meet them together as an assembly and you can have clues about them and suspicions about them and paint their characters. It's much, much harder to walk into a location with Hawthorne, for example, and right. immediately connect with everybody that I'm meeting and, 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 and trying to work out how they connect with each other. So, you know, that relationship, the, the detective and um, sidekick relationship is one I found very, very interesting and which, I, which I've explored in many different ways in, in my writing. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting. We talk a lot about on the podcast and in general um, about how mystery has a tendency to be undervalued, especially in academia, because it's genre fiction. But um, I think that's changing now and it's evolving. Um, but I remember one of my my first class um, as an undergraduate in college, I was a comparative literature major and it was forms of narrative. And they changed the curriculum every single year. But when I took it, the professor for that particular year basically only focused on um, mysteries, on um, construct of narrative and perspective and um, structuralism and mysteries. And I mean, it was everything from Frankenstein um, you know, to Chandler, et cetera, and, you know, sort of talking about how, how it as a genre is particularly uniquely suited to sort of altering structure and perspective so long as you play along with certain rules. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that, like, all of your work is a really good case study in that. And, you know, I certainly, as a former lit nerd, um, current lit nerd, um, Find, find it, um, you know, really useful to think about how you're writing them, actually. So that's, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. Well, Catherine, I must point you towards a short story I wrote. Um, but there's a special edition of Moonflower Murders, unfortunately not available in America or Canada, but it, but it will, I think, possibly next year with the, with, with the soft cover um, be included. Um, somebody else needs to write some extra material. So I wrote a short story at the back of Moonflower Murders with um, Atticus Punt. No, with Alan Conway, forgive me, with the writer, in which he discusses a theory of mine, which I've always had, which is how every single work of great literature, and incidentally, I never make a divide between what is great literature and what is genre fiction. I think it's a, a slightly futile argument and, and, and irrelevant in some ways, and, it, and suggests a sort of a literary snobbery, which um, I don't think is particularly helpful at all. But anyway, in this short story, the discussion is, is that every single piece of Great writing can, if you look at it in the right way, be a murder mystery story. And you could say that, take Othello, it's after all, it has a murder, and I use Othello in Moonflower Murders as a reference point, and Agatha Christie used Othello very much in Curtain, the last, uh, the last um, Hercule Poirot story. And in the short story I've written, Alan Conway takes a very, very famous piece of writing and twists it and turns it into an absolutely straightforward genre murder mystery story. And for what it's worth, while we're on the subject, the very first episode of Foil's War, which I wrote, gosh, I told you that 17 or 18 years ago, is actually a very famous film, The Graduate, the Dustin Hoffman film, which you may or may not have seen. Oh, yeah. But I looked at that film and I thought, you know, that could so easily be a murder mystery. And that's what inspired the very first episode of Foil's War. Oh, I'm going to have to rewatch that episode now. That's you'll see it. If you do watch it, you'll see it. Wow. That's fascinating. No, I mean, I think that that's, uh, I think that's 
Very true. I mean, we've talked a little bit in the past about how even if you look at something like Jane Austen, like Emma could be kind of read as like a detective story. Since you mentioned it, my short story that I just mentioned, I think I talk about Emma as well, or maybe it's Pride and Prejudice, it's one or the other. Pride and Prejudice, you know, uh, Mr. Darcy could so easily be, be murdered by somebody, he's so unpleasant at the beginning of the book and everyone's got these, you know, this prejudice about him. One of them could have easily bumped him off without realizing what sort of person he was. So it's just there, it's exactly that, but you oh, could I mean, do it. I mean, there was a book some years ago, Pride and Prejudice with Zombies, uh, which was actually quite a bestseller, but you could do Pride and Prejudice with a detective just as easily. Yeah. Say, um, P.D. James, in one of her very last books before she passed away, Death, uh, Death, Death Comes from Pemberley. Pemberley. Yeah, Death Comes from yeah, Pemberley. Yeah. I have that downstairs. I have a signed copy by her downstairs. I met her months before she died. She signed that copy for me. Uh, we're, we're a little bit sad that we never had a chance to uh, talk to her before she passed away, obviously. One of the greats. One of the greats. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have um, a pretty a specific kind of writerly question about how you wrote Magpie Murders and, Moon, and Moonflower Murders, because and you, you referenced this already that it is slightly different. The book within the book in Magpie Murders is split up, right? We're given most of it. And then there is a there is a chapter or maybe it's a couple of chapters at, you know, at the end that we don't get until later on in the book. So whereas in Moonflower Murders, it's a, you know, it's a much cleaner nesting where it's the entire classic murder mystery with the contemporary mystery surrounding it. How do you write these? Do you write one, do you write the mystery within a mystery first? And then, because I, I, I mean, it's an honest question because I'm just, I, I couldn't tell when I was reading it since they obviously have to be distinct, but what's also so um, masterful, I think what you do in them is that they do have echoes of each other as well as you're reading. So even though the mystery functions differently, there are aspects, there are things that happen to the characters, things that they do and say and are preoccupied with that also, you know, that the two narratives do share. So The greatest fun I had in the books was finding sort of, you know, coincidences. For example, the Mozart opera that features both in the Atticus Punt novel and in the Alta novel. It's the same opera and it's the same, you know, uh, mystery sort of around it, but different solutions as to why, as to what it, why it's in both times. And that was, was part of the fun of it. But you asked where I began. And the answer to that is I always begin, well, in both cases I began, with the modern mystery because my view was that Alan Conway in Moonflower Murders visits a hotel and he constructs from but he visits a hotel and and he is investigating a modern murder mystery a guest has been brutally stabbed on the night of a wedding and it just happens by coincidence that he had met that guest and knew something about him He then takes the information that he finds over a few days spent at the hotel and constructs a novel. So the Alan Conway novel comes second. And I have to know what happens first to be able to write the second. But then, of course, when I start my work, I'm actually balancing both stories together. And I'm doing furious note-taking and arrows and diagrams and schematics and sort of constructing this, this double world almost at the same time as I write. So when I, so when I actually do sit down, right, here is my notebook here. And I mean, it, I mean this, is, this is a notebook for, um, you know, this is just, you know, it's just it's endless lists and, and page after page of suspects and, and who they all are. And, you know, it goes on. This is just, this is just Moonflower Murders. And it's, it's a case of, there is, you know, I just said to you before we began talking that I'm one chapter away from finishing my new book. And all the answers that I need to have are in this book. Right, right. That makes sense. That makes sense that you're starting. It's like you're working your way in because you do have to start with the the book that is, you know. Obviously, as you continue through from the from the uh, modern murder into the golden age murder and then back into the modern world again, you are constantly having to rethread new clues. You think up new ideas and then you just go back in. I mean, I did probably six drafts of Magpie Murders before it was finished, and I've done so far three, four drafts of the new Hawthorne novel. Moonflower Murders was about four drafts as well. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of rewriting and re-weaving everything in. It's right. It goes back to what I said, the clues have to be in plain sight. You cannot just simply announce something on page 450 if you haven't actually given the reader the chance to spot it 200 pages earlier. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. One of my, 
It's one of my uh, greatest pet peeves. If I'm reading some novel and you get to the end of it and you're like, this came out of nowhere. I just like will write the book and possibly the author off for some time because it's not playing fair. I'm well, the worst offenders are TV. I think most book writers, because the book goes through a publishing process and there's an editor and there's a team involved in making sure that everything works, um, a book after, I, I haven't, I think, the only real culprit in that, the, the, the writer who I very much admire, who often cheats, is, is Doyle. I mean, Sherlock Holmes will frequently leave the scene and just return with exactly the information which he needs to solve the crime. Yeah. And that always, but then I always think that actually, for all his genius, Doyle was not so interested in the detective story in the in the in the in the true sense of murder investigation solution i think he was much more interested in in slightly more bizarre stories and um and 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 and, and in, in creating a world rather than you know in actually having you know obvious murder mysteries look at how look how few murders there are actually in doyle stories uh his best stories red-headed league springs to mind no murder um right uh, so you know so so, but, you know, but television sometimes I'll watch a series and it's only when I get to the end. I say, hold on a minute. I had no chance of solving that. How dare you? Give me back my six hours. Well, <laughs> you know, I heard an interesting comment um, the other day about narrative podcasts and about how narrative nonfiction podcasts, so like true crime, and about mm -hmm. how they're a terrible cheat, really, because if it was a television show or a novel, a narrative crime story, an editor would never, ever let you just be like at the end. And then I sat there and considered this journey and the information that I have, like, you know, received over this course of 12 episodes and we've solved nothing. There is no answer. And we have possibly not given you accurate information, which is like what a lot of them actually function as. You know, it's sort of, um, it's sort of long form journalism or a mystery novel without the editing. I quite enjoy such podcasts. I mean, I saw that you know, making, making a murderer was, for example, gripped the entire world when it was on television. And, and that never had a satisfactory ending of any sort. Um, uh, and sort of 20 hours later, we were really none the wiser as to what actually happened. And there is a side to me that dislikes these modern true crime stories, partly because it's something I write about a lot. Murder and the destruction of life and violence and, and, and all the emotions that go with it are not something one would usually celebrate. They're not something that I believe is, has a place in sort of polite dinner party conversation and, you know, did he do it, didn't he do it? And you, you know, in, for example, the making of the murderer, um, you know, we, we are so familiar with the people who were accused, we always forget the young woman who was brutally killed and we don't think about her family who had to suffer her loss. And so there's a part of me that sort of is a, a puritanical side of me. I'm not describing the program or people's enjoyment of it. I see its place. But for me, I love the world of <laughs> detective fiction because it is so elegant, because it is so unharmful, because it is so because it also deals in ultimate truths. At the end of the day, you leave, unless the final chapter is missing, um, you leave with a sense of completeness of everything in its right place, of the world being whole again. And I think that is one of the greatest values of a murder mystery novel. Right, we've talked a lot about in the past, um, sort of why um, mystery novels in particular tended to attract women and, um, sort of, you know, I think a lot of um, disenfranchised groups as well. And I think that one of the arguments for it is that mystery novels give you agency, right? You have all the clues in place. You are perfectly capable of solving it if you are clever enough and put the pieces together. And regardless of what happens, you get closure and again, the world being made whole again at the end. So especially if you are coming from a place of disenfranchisement, um, when reading a sort of detective story, you are allowed to have sort of that ability to be the driver and have solutions and have a wrapped up ending. And I think historically that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's why they are so satisfying still. And you know, one of the things that has come up a lot in quarantine um, is that 
um, if you look at what's selling heavily, we've talked to like some booksellers and librarians and such that follow um, our podcast. And the things that they can't keep on the shelves are like Agatha Christie novels. And it seems that in lockdown, people want that sort of, again, making the world whole again. I think, I think that is absolutely true what you're saying. I mean, one of the things I love about murder mysteries is I cannot think of another genre of fiction where the central character and the reader are more joined at the hip, if you like, are walking side by side. You know, the, the detective and the, and the reader are, the, are, the, are, are, are making the exactly the same journey at exactly the same time, acquiring the same knowledge together. And one of them, the reader or the detective, is going to be the first to come up with a solution. And that is an immensely satisfying and enjoyable journey. I'm not entirely sure about the gender thing in that discussion as to why that might be of more of appeal to women than to men. Uh, it's not a question I ever really asked myself because I, you know, even my kids' books, the Alex Ryder books, which are meant to be for boys, I've never thought of as being for anything other than just for readers. I don't tend to divide my audience. But, um, but it is, I think, a very, very satisfying journey. And, and I think you're right also, but in the time of COVID, in this time of, 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 of loneliness, um, I, I was writing about this, actually. I wrote a essay about this only yesterday, where it occurred to me that the pleasure of a, of a great murder mystery is very similar to the, to the pleasure of a crossword. Uh, and, the, the, and it's no, no coincidence that many crossword compilers have also been mur murder mystery writers and many detectives, one thinks immediately of Morse, uh, have been uh, cruciverbalists, which is a word that every cruciverbalist will know, meaning a crossword enthusiast. Um, so, well, and what the pleasure the, is, the, the pleasure way. is, is that it is totally absorbing. That when you are doing a crossword, and I love crosswords, all that matters is solving the clues and the pleasure that you get when you, when you solve it. And that gives you a light in another clue, which then spreads further around the board. And that is a pleasure that makes you utterly unaware of the incompetence of politicians, of the high death rate, of the contagion that is going all around the world and of the economic collapse that we are facing at the moment. All these horrors, just briefly, temporarily disappear in something that is, you know, you were talking about literature. It is not literature, it is just entertainment, but it is entertainment of the highest order. And, and it is never more valuable than it is right now. I mean, I'm, I'm a diehard crossword puzzle fan. So, um, you know, you're, you're speaking to the choir um, in that regard, but I, I do think that um, I, do you think that that is the satisfaction of that? It's also, of course, how a lot of people have dismissed mystery novels in the past, is that, you know, it's just like a crossword puzzle. And so there's something wrong with that. I mean, I see nothing wrong with that. I mean, a lot of my writing has been informed by the, the fear, if you like, that writing a whodunit or reading one is, in some respects, a colossal waste of time. I mean, you know, I was working on Midsummer Murders for many, many years, which is a hugely successful and popular TV show. And if it, when I say waste of time, I'm not using that as an insult. I'm merely saying that it doesn't actually do very much for sort of, you know, human knowledge, for sort of human progression. It is, you know, two hours watching an episode of Midsummer Murders. What do you come away with? Is it just the butler did it? Is that the end? Is that why we read a murder mystery? And I've been fascinated by the idea that actually the genre can be used to do more. Foil's War was created, I created Foil's War, simply because I wanted to explore, the, to explore the murder mystery form in a different way. And the, the, the what matters in those stories of Foil's War, although I hope every single one is in its own way a perfect murder mystery with clues, red herrings, suspects, a surprise ending, a great reveal, and a good detective, you know, wonderfully played by Michael Kitchen. But what I was really doing was telling stories about the Second World War, 1940 to 47. That, to me, was what mattered, that when you came away from an episode of Foil's War, you would know something you had not known before. My favourite episode of Foil's War, The French Job, does not have a murder in it. It doesn't even have a crime in it. It merely pretends to have. 
And that's why I love that particular episode. So I'm not, don't let your listeners think that I am describing a genre which I absolutely adore. And I'm looking at your shelf behind you and I'm seeing Kate Atkinson, who is brilliant. And I'm seeing Lucy Foley, who is absolutely wonderful. The guest list, a book I would recommend to anybody. These are, these are wonderful books. But what I am saying is, is that, that I've always sought to add extra value in my, in my own work. And I think that uh, uh, you know, so many authors have, and certainly our focus, you know, being Christie, Christie absolutely does. And you know, that idea of in Foyle's War, you know, you're using murder mystery as a means of telling stories that then also enrich one's experience or no or knowledge of World War II. Christie absolutely does that. I mean, there are so many themes that preoccupy her and her and her settings, uh, both as to place and time and how she brings you into periods of history and you know ends up teaching i think readers more about them than you know a, a dry history book that's absolutely something that's happening even if readers aren't aware of it i mean one of the interesting things we've we've realized in studying the texts more closely than I think casual readers do, and then also side by side watching all the adaptations. And perhaps we can talk a little bit about your Poirot adaptations also uh, in, in this way, is that, you know, the the Poirot series made the choice, and, I, and, and the very understandable choice, to set all of Christie's Poirot stories in pretty much the same time, right, in the mid-30s. So they're all taking place in and around 1935, 1936, Christie's novels are very much spanning decades, oh, right? Well, She's spanning is to the 60s. I mean, it's a yeah. long, many decades. That's absolutely correct. And incidentally, you must remember the, the series I worked on, Agatha Christie's Poirot, was set very, very much in a sort of an art deco <laughs> world, with a very sort of middle of the between the wars sort of feel to them. Um, that the producer who I worked with late did stopped making them and, and a new producer took over. And I think the more recent um, uh, adaptations have moved the show into different decades. Um, certainly that was true of Pale Horse. Um, uh, so, um, so it has moved on a bit, but you're right. It was the, the, the shows I worked on were very much set in period. So I think that sometimes that compression and, and in that, you know, with Agatha Christie is one of those authors who many people experience honestly, first and foremost, through the adaptations. I think that sometimes the compression that happened there in terms of setting um, uh, takes away from how she was evoking the post-war period, for example, in her novels in the 50s, which is where we are right now. We're kind of working our way through things chronologically, and we're just about to cover um, Ordeal by Innocence. So we're just about to go into the 60s. And, you know, the 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 tone of those novels and what the the characters are kind of experiencing uh in in the later 40s and 50s is so different from what she's doing in a lot more of the glittery splashy 20s and 30s novels for example you really do see a change um which which she's you know uh, putting in those books and um you know it's again i totally understand why the adaptations are putting them all in, all in the same period. But I think that that sometimes is, is why people don't necessarily appreciate how many different things Christie actually was um, doing in her books. You know, and the only other point I wanted to make, just circling back to what you were saying about, you know, true crime and the idea of focusing on the solving of a crime and in some ways almost the innocent, right? And the idea is that when you're solving a crime, you are making the innocent, the innocent parties whole because you're taking away the cloud of guilt that's hanging over everyone until a murder mystery is solved, right? Because it's like, these 10 people could have done it, but nine of them are innocent or eight or whatever are innocent. And until it's solved, you know, they're not going to really be able to live full, meaningful lives. You know, that is such a Christie-ish impulse. And it's so different from the anti-hero obsession that I think we, you know, we've developed in the later 20th and now into the 21st century. Um, I don't, my sense is that I don't think Christie would have been as into the, you know, the uber focus on the evildoer um, as opposed to the, the innocent, but that doesn't mean that all she's doing is solving a crime and ooh, everything's perfect and wonderful at the end and the world she's created has nothing to do with the world that people are actually living in. You can still focus on solving a crime and the innocent and all of that and do all these other things that we're talking about in terms of evoking setting and certain themes and, and whatnot. Um, I think that that's just a, it's, it's, it's a point that sometimes uh, isn't, I, I think it's just not made enough. 
I think you're absolutely correct. I think that the settings of the Agatha Christie books are a critical part of them and not just, you know, the, you know for the, the, they can be geographical, they could be historical, archaeological, of course, her fascination with archaeology through her second marriage, um, and, and just the sort of the physicality of the world and the class system and the sort of the, 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 the deference. So many aspects of life in those different decades are reflected in her books. And I think you're absolutely right to point it out. You know, what, it's, it's a, an, another reason why I, I do love the book. To be honest with you, for Agatha Christie, I go first to her plotting. I mean, to me, that is the, her greatness. It is her her ability to construct plot and to and to and to come up with revolutionary ideas in book after book after book. That is, if I was drawing my hit list of why I love Agatha Christie, that would be number one. And it's certainly what I have most taken from her in my own work. I try not to copy her, but I am certainly inspired by what she's doing. Uh, but I do take your point that the settings and the world that she describes have, have, have an impact and importance too. I think it's a point well made. Um, I also have to say, sort of, almost circling back there, one of the things that I love most about Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders is that in some ways, Alan Conway is the real villain in both of them. There's something just um, extremely awful about him. And it's, of course, you need to know about Alan Conway in order to solve both of the mysteries, really. Um, but um, I like that he never actually is there. He's, he's gone by the time, you know, we get to any of them. So he is just this ominous presence lurking off screen that, you know, off page that you're sort of left to dwell on his almost sociopathy, um, you know? And I think that that is such a smart decision. And, you know, I just, um, it makes him much more of an ominous presence, I believe, because he's not there. What is interesting is that in the TV series, which I have adapted myself, six scripts, he is actually quite a major character. He is in a lot of scenes. And for me, as the writer, it was quite interesting almost to meet him for the first time, because you're absolutely correct. My decision in the books was to make him just a presence, an evil presence on the outside, inspired instantly by Conan Doyle himself. It's always fascinating me, writers who have an antipathy towards their own characters. Agatha Christie famously only once talked about Poirot in highly disparaging terms as being a sort of a, I forget what the words are, a creep comes into it, I think, and, and sort of, you know, how much he hated him. But Doyle was much, much more anti uh, 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 much more antipathetic towards his hero because what did he do with Sherlock Holmes after you know, three successful books threw him off the rock and back hall uh, because he thought, Doyle thought, I'm, there, are, there are more important types of writing for me to be doing. And it was only when he had a gigantic mortgage on his new house that he went back to the How of the Baskervilles and mentored the latest short stories uh, and brought him back from the dead in a, in a, in a way I explore in, Sydney, in the House of Silk, in a way that makes no sense at all, but, but he just said that he needed the money. Um, so, um, so, yeah, Con Conway is not a nice man. I mean, he's not based on anybody I've ever met, inspired a little bit by oh, Doyle, yeah, but, and sure. certainly I hope not to write like me. <laughs> Um, is Susan based on anybody you know? Yes, Susan is based very much on the editor who was my um, editor at uh, Orion Books when I wrote um, Magpie Murders, the first book. The, the editor, who was very well known in publishing circles, was called Susan Lamb. And going into sort of the wordplay that I use in the books, um, a Ryland is a breed of lamb. So Susan Ryland is my hero. Which I think you even mention in Moonflower Murders, don't you? Because I do she... think I refer to it. Yes, I think I, I, a journalist had, had mentioned to me in print that Susan Lamb was the inspiration for Susan Ryland. So in the second book, I come clean. You do uh, clean on that. Right, right. Well, I think I, I think I know the answer to this, but it's funny. When Catherine and I were both reading Moonflower Murders, we both underlined this, this same sentence. And it's, uh, it's a statement that Susan Ryland makes. I, I want you to see if you agree with it. I think it would be fair to say that a whodunit is one of the very few forms of literature that rarely merit a second read. <laughs> um, I have friends, my, my dear friend Kate Moss, who has herself written a wonderful murder mystery story called The Taxidermist's Daughter, I recommend it to you, um, regularly reread Jacqueline Christie. And I have myself reread quite a few of the books. My mother-in-law rereads them endlessly, actually, um, and such. 
Um, so I'm not sure I do entirely agree with Susan Ryland. I think that's the editor in her speaking, because having spent so long working on the damn thing and sorting out all the punctuation and grammatical faults and arguing with Alan Conway, I can quite see that she's had the one read of it is enough for her. But actually, there is a pleasure to be had in rereading it. In fact, I recently reread Roger Ackroyd. Um, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, because um, I wanted to see if actually Agatha Christie had played fair with the reader. I was going to be interviewed about the book, so I reread it. And it was a very interesting exercise to read it in the knowledge of one of the greatest twists ever written in a, in a murder mystery book, and seeing how it plays through, how she did it. So I think the second read does give you a little bit of an insight into the, into the mechanics of the thing. Well, thank God you don't agree because we've devoted, you know, four plus years now to uh, rereading Agatha Christie. So we we definitely don't don't agree. No, I think I think Susan is a little bit waspish there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, there there are so many Christie references in both books. Also, I mean, having just finished Moonflower Murders, I actually kept count. And you name checked, not just, I mean, you know, actually name checked Christy six times, seven times if you count Mary, a Mary Westmacott reference that you also make in the, the book within a book. Um, you know, we definitely, we, we loved all of those. I think you have some, you know, very subtle and sly references, including um, what I believe is a nod to Five Little Pigs in that you have two sisters, one of whom facially disfigured the other in, in a, uh, a fight. Was that a... Um, it's more, I love Five Little Pigs, um, and uh, but actually, and I read it only quite recently, a second time. There you go. Um, uh, about three or four years ago, I reread that, and I think it's probably subconscious rather than actually done on purpose. To be honest with you, I, um, I, I think I added the scar later, and I forget exactly why. But I don't think Five Little Pigs was in my head. Sorry to disappoint you. No, um, well, there, are, there are there are. Funny thing, isn't it? I know your podcast is very much Christie centered, but you have to ask yourself why is it that when you consider Golden Age detective fiction, it is the books of Agatha Christie that, that still to this day resonate and stand completely apart? I mean, I love Ellery Queen, I love Nagayo Marsh, I love um, Dorothy. <laughs> um, many, many of these writers are wonderful. But there is something about Agatha that stands out, but just separates her from the pack. You know, this queen of crime tag is still true to this day. And um, I am fascinated about what that is. And I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and I sort of search for it when, I, when I'm writing my own books, trying to sort of just, just to sort of, to smell that genius. That's what, I mean, that's what we've devoted, you know, this podcast in some ways too. I mean, in, and in some ways, there's a very simple answer, which is just, she was an amazing writer. I mean, which is still to this day also, even given her enduring popularity, a controversial statement to make. I mean, there are a lot of people that would say, no, she wasn't a good writer, she's a good plotter. And I, I just don't think that's true. I mean, I think that if you do read, read the text and you reread them, part of the reason why they've endured is just that she wrote a really good story in all elements of story. I mean, no one is as readable as Christie. And while readability is easy to dismiss because it means that you're flipping the pages very quickly, I'm sure you, you know, as, as you well know, I mean, that is, it's a, it's a quality that is, um, I think, hard, hard to uh, manifest on the page. So ease of reading does not necessarily equate to ease of writing. Um, so I think she has inclination there or talent. So it's very, very good at atmosphere. I mean, you know, you think about the sort of dread in, and then there was none. I mean, that's really, I mean, so many modern horror films would, could wish to just bottle the atmosphere of the book, which comes in the language and the descriptive writing. Or uh, another of my very favorites of hers, Death on the Nile. You know, that's an immensely poignant and sad book. And, and, and when you read that book, you really do feel a little bit burned by the, by the Egyptian sun and by the passion and by, by the, you know, the story that, that takes place, particularly after the murder has been revealed in that book. You know, what then happens is sort of uh, interesting. And, and I, I, I agree with you. You know, her books are absolutely scattered with classical references. And it's clear that she herself was, you know, you, you know drawing on romantic poets and Shakespeare and, and, and classical music and all sorts of, uh, of areas to, to, to make her work richer than just simply, you know, a bog standard whodunit. Um, and, uh, I, I cannot disagree with your, with your thesis.
<laughs> I mean, I think, and the other thing, the only other specific answer, you know, I think we we have landed on after thinking about this so much for four years is also that even though she isn't, you know, an A plus plotter, a lot of her plots do hinge on character, actually, an understanding of characters. So when you understand, Five Little Pigs is, by the way, our top ranked novel currently. In you know, I was going to ask you, is that your? Uh, I was going to ask both of you. I was going to ask you a question. Which is your favorite Agatha? Five Little Pigs. Well. Five little it depends on, I mean, then it, what does favorite mean? Our highest ranked Christie novel is... That's, so that's your, you see, that's, that's uh, for me, the murder at the heart of Five Little Pigs is one of the most fascinating murders in the whole of detective fiction. Yes. The relationship between the murderer and the victim at the moment of the murder is so extraordinary and sinister and profound that it does stay with me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, my, my own favourite, for what it's worth, is probably Cards on the Table. I've always loved that one very, very much. We're excited to hear that because we haven't I, ranked pretty, it, Anthony. <laughs> We haven't ranked pretty highly and we know that it's a little bit of a controversial opinion. Apparently there are a number of people who very much dislike Cards on the Table. We are, we are not amongst them. Are you a oh, bridge right. player? I'm sorry? Are you a bridge player? I'm not a bridge player. Um, it's curious. I I love the scene in Moonraker when Ian when uh, James Bond and Hugo Drax play bridge together, and the bridge game is described card by card by card. And I've read it many many times and loved it. And I love also the fact that the bridge actually is a clue inside cards on the table, the mechanics of the game, who was dummy at a certain time, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so, although I do not like bridge, in fact, I dislike bridge, I would go further to say, my mother used to play it all the time. Um, uh, that book I just love for its simplicity. I love a book with four suspects. The fact that it is, you know, and I love the, the conceit of it as well, a man who sort of collects murderers. It's such an interest. You know, and again, is what Agatha did so well, you know, that, that when you start writing a murder mystery, to get into the murder, in a novel way. It's not just a case of a murder happens and Poirot turns up. You know, the murder may be announced in a newspaper or it may be that, the, that, that somebody is putting themselves in harm's way by playing cards with murderers. That I think is such the, is, is, is wonderfully ingenious and, it's, and, and the entry into the books is often one of the reasons why I just love them so much. It's very daring to have a full-length novel with just four suspects, especially considering how many suspects she usually has. And it just absolutely works. And it makes the book stand out. And there is a sort of um, almost cleanliness to, you know, to the, the conception of that that is extremely pleasing. And it, it makes the book stand out in the canon. I totally agree with that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm glad that I haven't chosen a turkey. No, she actually, I don't think there is a single turkey in her entire collection. I'm trying to think of it as a, an Agatha Christie that I don't like. Um, I would guess it would probably be one of the later Tommy Tuppence type books, which I was never so crazy about. But, but I, I, don't think there's an, I don't think she's written a book I haven't enjoyed. Uh, uh, I can say that with, with absolute confidence that every single book of hers I have enjoyed in one way or another. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, in that we're, we're doing a, a project of ranking, we certainly have, um, there's some divergent. Less, less favorites. Yes, <laughs> we, we have less favorites. I actually wanted to ask you because, um, you know, a book that we covered recently, which quite frankly, we ranked extremely low because we should also, we should also tell you, you know, one thing we don't shy away from when we're, when we're discussing Christy and ranking Christy, which I think is an important part of the experience of reading her, um, now, when, you know, in, in any time, is um, we have a category for stuck in its time elements. So elements of Christie's writing that jar, um, you know, not because we're living in such a, uh, you know, an advanced and utopian time in which <laughs> racism and anti-Semitism and misogyny don't exist. We are obviously just as flawed as Christie's world was, but sometimes the portrayal of, you know, those aspects of the novels um, can mar, you know, the, the reading of the books. And to be, to be perfectly frank, one book that, um, where that was a huge element of, of the novel was Hickory Dickory Dock, which happens to be one of the books that I believe you adapted for. I did it. Yes, you're right. And, uh, and, and there is, because this is a hostel in London and the, the students are foreign students there, they are a little bit racial stereotypes, I, I seem to remember. 
Yes, yes. No, and you know, we we and we talked about I mean, I think that was probably a pretty difficult book to adapt. Um, you know, be because of that. I was wondering if among the, you know, I won't go through all of the seven, I think, short stories that you adapted, but you did adapt Hickory Dickory Dock, Murder on the Links, Lord Edgeware Dies, and Evil Under the Sun uh, for the Suchet series. And I'm wondering if you had a favorite, either among those or maybe one of the short story episodes that you did earlier on. Um, we honestly do. The, um, first of all, I don't have a, an enormous memory of, of, of how hard or easy they were to do. They were always a pleasure. David Suchet remains for me the greatest Poirot of all of them. I, don't, I suppose you must discuss in your, in your forum um, your favorite Poirots. And I mean, you know, there's Branagh and there's Ustinov and there's Finney. But for me, there's only really Suchet. I think his, his work was marvelous. But what was interesting about the series was that I adapted, as you correctly say, four novels, but also seven short stories. And they were very different challenges because the novels were almost too long and too detailed to make up the 90 minutes or whatever it is, 96 minutes, which is the length of, a, of, a, of an Agatha Christie's Poirot. But short stories, which were often very slight and simple, were only the beginning, the starting point often for, um, for the story that would follow. And I much preferred adapting the short stories because the rule was that I had to have the same murderer and the same method of murder, but outside that I could do anything I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I could embroider. And so if you ask me my, my favorite adaptations, I would go for Yellow Iris, mm -hmm. which, was, which expanded in all sorts of directions, but still remained true, of course, to Christie's rather clever idea. I mean, I rather love the sort of the idea that she had obviously in a restaurant, because I have a feeling she probably just was having lunch one day and scribbled down the thought on the back of an envelope, which then turned into the story of the Yellow Iris. And I enjoyed writing that one very much, but also The Double Clue, because that's the only book, as far as I remember, in which Poirot has a serious relationship with um, a, a woman, uh, the Countess, um, whatever, I can't remember her name now. Uh, but, of course, Countess Rosakoff. And, yeah. and being, having the leisure to actually stay with the character and talk about things that were not murder, but were about themselves, was, was a wonderful thing to, to be able to do. That's a lovely so, episode. The, the... Yeah, I love, and it has lovely music. I still remember very much the music that, that I think Chris Gunning was the, the music writer that he put on it, which was very, very lovely and touching. And of course, David does it very, very well because he, as being the protector of horror, wouldn't, I think he was, I seem to remember that when we were discussing that episode, he was very, very nervous about pushing the romance too far and turning it into something that Agatha Christie herself would not have liked. And so we were very careful. And I think what is interesting about it is the tension between the two of them, because not only is she the love interest and he admires her, she is also the main suspect. And that I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. plus, it, plus it has a, plus the actual double clue of it uh, is something that- Yes, that is, also, that, that is also, but that's pure Agatha. I mean, that is really pure Agatha, the way that, you know, that a clue can have two interpretations. I think that's great. <laughs> Um, wait, Kemper, did you, sorry, I'm just blanking for a second. That's okay. Um, I have, I can, I have, I have one very, um, perhaps an irritating question to ask you as a Christie fanatic for a Christie reference that you made in Moonflower Murders, mm -hmm. um, which is that there's, and it's funny because this is, this is, you know, um, a legitimate issue in Christie. She talked often about how um, if she had her way, she was really most comfortable um, writing in uh, the novella form, like writing something that was more like 40 to 50,000 words. That was kind of the, you know, for her, the, the best format for these mysteries. And she did often have to pad out her mysteries so that they would become novel length. And your mystery within a mystery is on the shorter side. And, and you know, after we finish it in Moonflower Murder, Susan Ryland says, yeah, and you know, there's that one chapter that feels like a short story, but we kind of had to leave it in because if not, it wouldn't have been you know long enough for a novel. And you make reference to um, two Agatha Christies that are particularly short. One of them, on the Death on the Nile is one of them. But Death on the Nile, I mean, and I don't have the word count here, so perhaps I'm wrong, I, and I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm legitimately asking a question because my and I looked just to check, at least in my copy, Death on the Nile. I always remembered as being one of the longer Christies, not one of the well, the shorter ones. I think you'll find. I mean, I I can't 
say for certain, I can't even remember how I got that piece of information or why I thought of that, but I'm sure that it's, it's that, and there's another Agatha Christie, there are two which are very, very short in the 70,000 barrier. And it's interesting, incidentally, that my new Hawthorne novel, when I, I, mean, I am now on 69,900 words, it's where I am at the moment, because I'm looking at it on the computer screen, and it's going to turn out to be short. It's going to come in at 75. I mean, I can't see it actually reaching the magical 80, which I think is the correct length for a murder mystery and certainly for a modern published novel. But, but that is the way it is. Um, it's the, that sort of... I don't forget, you're talking to somebody with much less knowledge of Agatha Christie than you guys have. I'm just an enthusiast and an admirer, and I haven't read the books probably as many times or as carefully as you have. Uh, but... But, but it's just one thing that has traveled with me, which is that that is one of the shorter Christies. And I, ha I have it downstairs, um, a, a very nice edition of it. And, and, and you're right, it's, it doesn't seem any shorter or longer than, than this one, which is the uh, Mysterious Affair of Styles, which is beside my desk at the moment. Um, one, the one that is truly short is The Body in the Library, actually. The Body in the Library barely clears 200 pages. It almost feels like a long novella. Um, and it's one of my favorites, actually. I mean, I love a short, you know, I love a, a, a kind of concise, efficiently told, uh, a, you know, any genre book, but especially mystery. But that is, you know, that was often, I think, an issue with Christie. So I like that you just sort of, you know, make reference to it. But yes, the Death on the Nile reference confused me um, a little bit, but... Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always tempted, since we're talking on the computer, to go into some Google thing and say, what is the shortest Agatha Christie book? And it'll, someone will probably tell me, but... Uh, but right. uh, Right. And I might, you might, you might have caught me. I mean, I, I make mistakes. You know, I always, I, I have to say that, that when I'm writing these books, I always remember that, that Doyle, who is another great hero of mine, uh, I love his work, made many, many errors in his murder mysteries. Uh, they are, you know, part of the joy of reading Holmes is to spot all the, the sort of almost deliberate errors. Snakes cannot climb ropes. So there goes the sort of speckled band, uh, probably his most famous and much most loved story. Um, Snakes are deaf as well. He, he doesn't know these sort of things. And, 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 and but you know, if, if, if a writer so much better than me can make mistakes, then I'm not gonna get too worried if I'm actually wrong about death on the Nile. To air, to air is human and we don't want these books written by robots. No, I mean, Christy, made, Christy not only made mistakes, but then she shone lights on those mistakes in subsequent books, most famously, uh, she has her, you know, her, her um, counterpart, Ariadne Oliver, reference the fact that actually, uh, blow blow darts like these pipes that she used in Death on the Death in the Clouds uh, would have had to be four feet long, and she had them being like six inches long. And the you know readers wrote into her saying, actually that's impossible, and you know she that that kind of thing was happening to her all the time as well. So uh, I think it, well, it's part of the fun. Yeah. The other great writer in my life is of course Ian Fleming, and in From Russia with Love. He spends, I think, two chapters describing the headquarters of Smirsch in Moscow, right down to sort of the color of the radiators and the which, which you know, the number of the door and the, and how many windows it's got. And somebody later on went to Moscow to find it and discovered that actually the building he had been describing was a florist. So that in itself was something of a, a mistake. But do we care when the writing is so good and when the picture that's being drawn is so vivid? Uh, so I, I don't fear mistakes and um, and and. Uh, I fear that my books are littered with them. Um, I haven't quite yet risen to the quantity of books written by Agatha Christie, although I'm chasing, and if, uh, if I have another two years in me, I just might get there. But, mm -hmm. but I think that that is one of the problems. So when you come down to being uh, writing one book a year, or she, I think, wrote even more than that, um, you, you do find yourself slipping over some of the details. Well, Anthony, I would say that when you're getting to the point where readers are reading as closely as I am, because I'm obsessed with your books, and and you know and caring enough to ask that you you've you've already won the game so uh it's it's, well, it's a, a joy, not a problem <laughs> that is a, a lovely thing to say and i and i'm grateful to you thank you i just have i mean we always ask uh every anyone that we interview we always ask this and it's usually not an obvious answer but i suspect that this this will this question does have an obvious answer for you which is poirot or marple who do you prefer Um, you froze there. I think the question you were going to ask me was Quarrel or Miss Marple? I was, yes, yeah, sorry. And then it looked like, I think we, we both froze, uh, I, I think. In um, the internet's yes. had enough of it for today, but um, let, me, let me answer the question. Um, you know the answer is Poirot for me. I, I, I love Poirot. And um, when I was young, in my 
who are eight to 13, uh, I used to see the um, Miss Marple film starring Margaret Rutherford, who, for, who has a very, very special place in my life. And I absolutely loved those films. I still remember the murder in the 450 to Paddington, uh, one where, again, such a brilliant Agatha Christie device where two trains are side by side for a moment and Margaret Rutherford looks out of a window and sees a pair of hands strangling a woman. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it's like in The Mousetrap as well, which plays sort of the same game at the, at the end of Act One. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book and a wonderful film. And I did love Margaret Rutherford's that. But I am not a fan, actually, of the character in the books. Um, I'm not even a huge fan, I'm afraid to tell you, of Ariadne Oliver. Um, I like Poirot. I like Hastings. I like George the Valet. I like Jap. I like Miss Lemon. These are the characters I wrote uh, for, you know, and adapted for the screen and lived with. And they are the ones I've always enjoyed reading. Um, and although Pocket Full of Rye, I think is a wonderful book, um, Body of a Library is, is, is Miss, Miss uh, Marple, isn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, and I enjoyed that one, I seem to remember yeah. very much. Um, and Murder at the Vicarage as well. I mean, you know, I do like those books, but, but I'll always go, for, the Poirot books just have an edge to them. You're, you're I think it's, it's, that he's not just a, it's not instead of just that he's a man, not a woman. It's more to do with the fact that he is a foreigner, that he is, an, he is not inside the, the community, he is the outsider. And for me, in a murder mystery, the detective is always the ultimate outsider. He doesn't know anybody, and as soon as the solution is, has been revealed, he has no place. He has only to move on into the sunset. And that, I think, is what I love about the murder mystery genre. Mm. I love that answer. Yeah, oh. I, I think that might be a good place to end. I mean, that's, that's ending on a fairly- You have something to me out, Campbell. Although I have to say that it's been a total pleasure talking to you and Catherine, and, uh, and I hope you have material which will entertain your, your listeners and, you know, and be worth having done all this. We oh, do, and God. we want you just to get back to writing and finishing that third uh, Daniel-, Daniel I'm Hall. gonna do that right now. I mean, I'm in that, that last chapter right this minute. Please, please, let's, get, let, let's end this now, get off this Zoom so you, so you can get back to that. We can't wait to read it. <laughs> Thank you both very, very much indeed, and, um, and, and keep well and stay safe, and, and the same to all your listeners. All right, bye-bye. Bye, Anthony. Bye. Bye. So much, it's been a pleasure.